Hey everybody, welcome back to our neck of the woods. Uh, the rubber wall waterproofing is hardened, so today we're going to go ahead and start the backfill. So it's been three days. Uh, the rubber wall has now hardened, and uh, on day two, I actually went around with uh, an extra bucket here and went and found any crack or crevice that I didn't like uh, down where there's seams where blocks come together and down around the foundation. And I went all the way around it with a paintbrush and went ahead and filled those in. Uh, Rubber Wall does say that you can apply this product with either a spray gun like I did. You can also paint it and you can also roll it on. So there's many different applications that you can use. Uh, again, three days total. It's uh, fully cured. Um, when you touch it, it's actually very rubberized and actually has some spring back and bounciness. So we're going to go ahead and apply the dimple membrane that I just went ahead and picked up. Uh, we're going to have to cut it to fit these openings here and actually cut it to length because it's a little uh, tall for even up here. And then I've got the local guy that I know, uh, Adam, with a truck. Uh, he's bringing in several loads of stone. So the goal today is to basically get all of this finished with stone. Then I'll be able to drive the tractor in here and go ahead and finish out all of the stone in here. And actually tonight, I may be able, for the first time, be able to park in my garage. When looking for a dimple membrane, uh, we looked at uh, several different products. Um, it really came down to cost. Uh, this stuff here was $150 a roll, and we only needed four rolls for the entire house. Um, I also got it at Menard, so of course it has an 11% off rebate. Um, and the good thing about it is I only needed four rolls because it comes in 65 foot lengths, while other products only come in about 50 foot lengths. And some other products are only about four foot tall. Now that's a problem because we're only looking at about five feet going down. So that means that I would have to spend uh, money on eight rolls of someone else's product to only get that additional foot to get the dimple membrane up to grade. That would be an absolute huge waste of product and a huge waste of money. Um, some of those other products also have a filter fabric on them. That's great for keeping out sand and silt and stuff, but since we're backfilling with stone, sand and silt is really not a concern. So I didn't really think that I needed the filter fabric. Um, this stuff here, is seven foot three inches they also make an eight foot so for a normal size basement that works for them but we are going to have to cut off some of the bottom here uh, because i'm not going up seven foot three um, you could i guess but because we're going to be using a stone facade on the bottom or if you're bringing siding all the way down you obviously don't want to have the siding coming down and hitting this for a good foot or so because it's going to push it off of the house and then you're going to have kind of a, a, a bow at the bottom. So you are going to have to cut this to the length of where your grading is going to come up to. Now, this product here, I'm not exactly sure how I'm going to install it yet. Uh, the manufacturer recommends the dimples facing the foundation. Now, for a regular concrete foundation, that should be fine. Problem that I foresee is these dimples facing an ICF wall is when you do put stone and backfill against these, those dimples are going to be pushing into the rubber and pushing into the foam. Now, it's not going to hurt the rubber. Rubber wall is extremely elastic. In fact, if you go to the website, which I'll link a description below because people have been asking uh, what product I used. Um, there's a guy with like a two foot sheet of it and he's pushing his hand through and the rubber's like all the way up to his elbow and he can't push through it and it's not breaking. Uh, the other good thing about the rubber wall is it's self sealing. What I mean by that is if you put a nail or screw through it, whether you're going into, um, you spray that stuff on a regular concrete or cinder block wall or even the ICF wall the rubber will try to go back to its original shape and size so it'll form a seal around any nails or screws so that's perfect that you don't have to worry about water leaking behind a product uh, so 
we're gonna go ahead and figure out just how much those dimples can actually push in. Again, it's not gonna hurt the rubber wall to push in, but it will dent and push into the foam. So we're gonna have to see how strong that is. Uh, those dimples are pretty short and they're uh, completely flat and they're pretty fat and they're pretty close together. So that should spread the load out pretty well, but we're gonna have to see. I may end up turning it around just because I have an ICF wall versus a cinder block or concrete wall. So we're gonna go ahead and get measuring, get started. And we'll, uh, it does come with uh, some plastic discs. Uh, obviously they're thinking you're installing it on a concrete foundation. So they're saying to use like a masonry nail, which you would use a, uh, like a air or co2 powered gun to shoot it in um, we can just use regular deck screws so they don't rust out i do plan on only putting the uh, caps at the very top uh, they recommend putting the nails or screws depending on what your foundation is all the way on the product like in a w pattern at the top and down in the middle but i don't see the the reason to do that because you're backfilling with dirt or stone anyway depending on your project so why would you need to put one down below grade where you potentially could have a water leak? And if you're dealing with a cinder block or concrete, even if you do put rubber wall or another type of product on there, I really wouldn't want to put a below grade nail or fastener into concrete where water potentially could get to, rust that nail out, uh, hurt the coating behind it or bring rust right into your concrete foundation. You just put a whole bunch of penetration points of water through your uh, foundation. So I would only put something at the very, very top backfill. That's going to push the product up against the wall. So why would you need to do anything else? So let's go ahead and get started here. We'll set up the GoPro and see how easy this stuff is to uh, cut and handle. All right, so first thing I'm gonna do, I decided that five foot is gonna be our mark. So I'm gonna go ahead and take one of these rolls, roll it out, measure five foot down from the top, and then I'm gonna go ahead and cut off, looks like about two foot three inches. So we're gonna do that, and then that's gonna be our height all the way around. So again, we are gonna waste some product, but it's cheaper to buy just four rolls of a seven foot uh, product than having to buy eight rolls of a four foot product only to get that additional foot that I need to get up to the five foot mark. All right, so that was super easy to cut with a utility knife. It's not that thick this way. Uh, I did cut this piece off here and went up to the wall. I do think I am going to go ahead and install this backwards. I think I, I do want the uh, dimples to be facing outward. Uh, a couple reasons for that. I know they want you to install it this way, dimples against the product, so you have an air gap here. But with it being foam and ICF, if you're putting the dimples against the product and this stone ends up pushing this further into the foam, which it does push in a little bit, you're losing the air gap anyway. So because we're using 57 round as backfill, obviously you can see these stones are quite large. They really can't get in between there uh, and block this. Obviously you're still going to have light and everything uh, going up under there. So water still going to be able to get into these channels and work their way down behind the stone i just like the fact that this is flat back here giving you a little bit more surface area to push against the foam so i think this is going to be the way to do it uh, again the product did come with the uh, washers that we can go ahead and put screws through and attach it on the top and it came with these finishing strips that you'll put along the top plate so this is a DMX AG foundation wrap that I got from Menards, but it looks like it doesn't really matter which side you put it on. Uh, there's enough strip up here that we can attach it this way or this way, and uh, it should work either way. Again, we're not really worried about a lot of backfill with... Uh, uh, sand or silt or anything. We're going to be using this stone pretty much all the way up to grade and then a little bit of topsoil so we can go ahead and plant stuff, you know, around in here. Uh, so I think either way, waterproofing and protecting that ICF and that foam is the way to go. So we're going to install it that way and uh, hopefully it'll work out.
All right, so as you can see, I'm not overly concerned going eight inches on center with these, uh, which is where the uh, Fox reinforcement straps are. Um, each kit comes with 200, and like I said, I really don't see the point in putting any down in here since the stone is going to backfill anyway. Not to mention, even though the rubber wall is self-healing when you put a screw or nail in, um, the stone's pushing up against here anyway. So the fact that we've got a little bit of ripple, the fact that this right here is sticking out some, doesn't matter. The stone is gonna push all this down and make this flat as a pancake as soon as I throw it in here. So as you can see, each kit, like I said, is 65 foot long and it comes with 200 of these. And this wall right here, for example, I'm already done. And you can see just how many I have left over. So we're gonna have uh, a million of those left over. So it's tight enough. Uh, like I said, the goal today and the amount of stone that I bought is only enough to fill in this area right here and the garage. So I don't have to go down that way yet. Um, I just want to get the garage finished. That way we can get the sand and the foam and the PEX tubing in here ready to go so that we can pour the uh, garage slab the same time that we pour the basement slab. So right now to me, this is good enough. Um, as for sealing this right here, obviously there's gaps in there. Uh, the concrete uh, slab for the garage is going to go five inches thick here, and it's going to come out about two feet as an apron as it tapers down and away for water drainage. So no water is going to get in through here anyway because it's a five inch thick solid slab all that water is just going to pretty much run off this way um so this right now like i said is good enough so let's go ahead and start the backfill and uh call this project done um i am going to put uh the some leftover filter fabric or the geotech fabric on top of this so basically we have this geo fabric down here that I'll go ahead and re-roll back out. And this fabric here on the bottom is just to keep any of this uh, silt and clay from coming up into the pipe. We're going to go ahead and lay down about 30 so inches of stone. Then we're going to roll out another piece of filter fabric and then put more stone on. And that again is just for any dirt or debris that's up here blowing around in the wind that it's not going to travel down and get into the pipe. Now, again, on this wall here for the garage, it is not a concern at all since this is all going to be a concrete slab one day, but I'm just going to go ahead and use the same practice everywhere. And we're going to put that filter fabric all the way down there to uh, about a foot or so, about halfway uh, below grade. And then the rest of the stone will come up there. So anything that filters down through that top layer of stone, will hit that first layer of filter fabric and get all that out of there then it'll filter down more to the French drain and you'll have another layer of filter fabric that nothing can come up and basically ever clog this pipe.
All right, so we're gonna wrap it up there today. Uh, Adam was able to bring four loads. Um, I calculated somewhere around 60 to 70 tons that I would need, but I didn't really add in uh, around the walls in the garage where the ditches were. Uh, I just, I know I'm gonna need dozens and dozens of truckloads, so I just said bring four today. Uh, as you can see, we've got a beautiful taper going on out of the garage now. It's gonna get messed up again as I need to keep running in there with the tractor and 57 round really doesn't lock in like a normal driveway. So uh, you drive in there and you put a tire track right in it. Uh, but it makes for a good drainage stone. It makes for a good uh, stone to put concrete on top of. So uh, right now this taper will work beautifully. Uh, it may need a little bit more in here if not, we can just fill that in with concrete when all this goes out, but that'll be a nice drainage uh, right now for water uh, when the concrete does get poured. Um, if you guys are cringing, me driving in and out of here, yes, this foam is broken, uh, especially in here where I was doing most of the driveway, or most of the driving, but as you can see, the six inch concrete slab or a wall is a hundred percent there's absolutely nothing wrong with it and the reason why I don't care about this foam or that foam is because we've got a lip over here which is where the garage foam is going to come up to so the height of the garage foam will be the height of this and then all of this will get a five inch slab poured on top of it so concrete's going to cover all of this up out to here and I plan on doing about a two foot apron since we're not ready to pay uh get all this in a concrete slab especially with the rv still here so the apron will come out about two feet or so uh tapering down with this slope here uh, as you can see we are way short uh for four truckloads um there's spots over here i know it doesn't show up good on camera but i would say to the bottom of that that's probably the bottom of a block right there and these blocks are 16 inches tall so right there you can see the height of one block and we need to get up basically to that line so there's a good 16 plus inches in here that still needs to come out and that needs to happen pretty much all over the place uh, especially in here which you can kind of see i stopped made a line in there so we're going to need at least another truck or two uh, to finish this out um, I was talking with Adam, and I think I'm going to make the decision to probably not bring in sand. Um, the garage is not underground. Uh, this stone right here, for example, is higher than what is out there for a grade. So it's not like this garage can ever flood. So I do have the vapor barrier that I can lay down in here. Um, and if one of these stones were to puncture the vapor barrier, which it's not going to happen because it's round stone, it, it doesn't matter. We still have a closed cell foam going down. That acts as a vapor barrier too. So there's no moisture or anything that's going to come up in this garage. So sand's really not needed. So we'll finish it off with another one, two, two and a half truckloads of this 57 round. Uh, complete this out. And then hopefully in the next week or two when I ordered the foam, uh, it should be on its way. Uh, we'll be able to lay this down, uh, route out where the PEX tubing is going to go and the boiler and everything are going to go in that corner. Um, we did calculate that we're going to need about four zones in the garage. Usually for half inch PEX tubing, you can only do a 300 foot run max. So I think it's about... It's 938 square feet in here. So obviously if it was exactly uh, 300 feet per run, uh, that would get 900. So we would be quite short. Uh, so we'll go ahead and figure out how much each zone needs to run instead of going to 300 max. And we don't want one uh, run that's extremely small. So uh, we'll plan all that out when the foam gets here. Uh, we need to do still pretty much the same thing uh, in the basement. The uh, sand still needs spread. I'm still about four tons short. And then again, the foam showing up all together. And we'll go ahead and put that down and plan out the PEX tubing route for that also. Um, I would like to hear from people if they have an ICF house. Um, 
I kind of been worried about spending all of this money on radiant floor heating when we're gonna get uh, ductless uh, split units, uh, like AC units that attach up on the wall. Those don't cost that much money. We can get two or three for the entire house that have enough BTU that could heat and cool the house 100%. But the question is, it's electric heat and how efficient are they on heating? I'm not worried about the air conditioning. It's the winter heat for those things always being on. But being an ICF house and so airtight, uh, some blower door tests have tested ICF houses almost three times better than passive house ratings, which on a blower door test, it's around a 0.6. I've seen some ICF houses come in at about a 0.4 to a 0.2. So there's basically no air leakage in an ICF house at all. Um, then when you have such a good insulation value, you might be able to do electric heat and have the thing basically never come on. I would hate to spend two to three thousand dollars on all of these um, split units and then have them be able to heat the house in the winter and have our electric bill uh, not go up that much. Um, we're gonna have to have a boiler system for the garage. Uh, we may have to have another boiler system for the basement and the first floor. There's PEX tubings for the garage, the basement, and the first floor. There's pumps. Uh, I just said four zones for the garage. The basement's going to need about seven zones. The first floor is going to need seven zones. This radiant floor heating system for uh, all three parts of the house could add up easily to twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000. So to just buy a couple ductless uh, split units that can heat and cool, and again, to not have the... Um, uh, electric bill be, be that bad because they're basically never turning on and they are super efficient. Um, I would love to hear some comments uh, from people who are just using those. Um, I know there's another couple on YouTube uh, that did a timber frame house. They've got ICF in the basement and sit panels on the first floor and sit panels on the roof. And I believe last winter they heated the entire house with just a little electric uh, unit attached in uh, the basement up on the ceiling. And it was able to heat the entire house. Um, and it's a big house. It's like 36 by 36 for the basement and the first floor and they have ginormous vaulted ceilings with a 12-12 roof. Uh, the basement's got like 13 foot ceilings and the first floor is like 10 or 12, 13 foot ceilings also. So, I mean, it's a crazy uh, size house on the inside and to have one little unit in the basement heating the entire house comfortably that's pretty amazing. Now, he did say his electric bill is through the roof. Uh, but if you get a couple units where they're not turning on all the time and you're heating different zones more efficiently, electric heat may be the way to go. People have always said, oh, electric heat is horrible, never do it. But these are from people with traditional houses, stick frame, uh, two by fours, probably tons of air leakage um, that can't pass for passive house if their life depended on it and of course their electric bill is going to be horrible so um comment below if you guys have one if you know anybody with one uh and it with a icf house being that efficient electric may be the way to go especially if you're saving uh tens of thousands of dollars on an entire radiant floor heating package times three uh tomorrow we're gonna go ahead and lay more of the dimple membrane uh, down the front, the back, and the uh, side of the house over here. Um, I like the product. I think it went pretty well. It attaches pretty tight. And as you can see, I did not put any of those clips down below, but this thing ain't going nowhere. I mean, it's obviously super tight to the wall now because all that stone's pushing in. So we don't have any penetration points. If the rubber coating were to fail, um, the screws are all above grade. So even though they're deck screws, they're not going to rust out. So uh, I think it's going to work uh, pretty well, actually, uh, for the little cost that uh, I think I was able to pay for such a large envelope. So we're going to get cleaned up. We're going to get some dinner here. And uh, thanks for stopping by. And we'll see you on the next one.